let me first introduce Ned. Uh, uh, he's the director of U.S. EDER uh, project. EDER is a big point, and he's going to talk about it, but you know, U.S. is one of the members, as with China and Korea and the EU. And uh, he's the associate laboratory director of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's a plasma physicist, so you know, we like plasma physicists here. And uh, uh, he, he has P, uh, he master's and a bachelor's degree in MIT, and his PhD uh, in Princeton in astrophysics uh, sciences. And uh, before he started at US Eater, he, was, he worked at PPL, and he worked at uh, TFDR, and after that at Princeton Beta Experiments. Uh, so there's a lot of people that know about here. And then he moved to US Eater office, and he's a member of the American uh, Physics Society, and associate member, member of the uh, uh, Advancement of Sciences and IEEE, and he's the president of IEEE USA, and member of the IEEE Board of Directors uh, in 2001. And so I'll introduce Ned here. Thank you very much for coming here, and hopefully you'll give us insight about fusion and theater. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, well, I want to thank the uh, thank uh, Professor Carter and all of you for inviting me to come. And I must say that I'm completely exhausted after a day of talking to everybody. <laughs> but I am uh, totally bedazzled by all the wonderful things you do. And don't confuse that with the Wizard of Oz, okay? But anyway, <coughs> so, so several people throughout the day have asked me, what did I really mean by my title, okay? And there's a purposeful ambiguity there. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions was, do you mean that you're passionate about fusion energy? And the answer to that is yes, okay? And the reason is, it's good science, good engineering, and it's worth exploring as a potential energy source, has abundant fuel, there's uh, virtually no possibility for requiring public evacuation from design basis accidents, Okay, there's no high-level radioactive waste, of which you wouldn't want to have any significant volume. And as uh, Professor Goldston and Professor Glazer said, you know, there's significantly reduced nuclear proliferation risk. So, yes, passionate about fusion energy. Second possible interpretation, so are you saying that burning plasmas, meaning study of self-heated plasmas where the fusion power dominates the behavior, are you saying that that's the next major step for fusion? And the answer to that also is yes, because there are several key scientific questions that have to be asked in the environment of a burning plasma. One of them is, how does it behave when the plasma is self-heated, where it's not controlled from external sources, where it's controlled by the brewing of the plasma itself? Secondly, what's the influence of these energetic alpha particles which come shooting out of the fusion reaction? And thirdly, what does the what's the behavior of a plasma at the scale of a fusion reactor? So there are some key questions that we have to ask. And so, yes, I want to talk about that too. But let's, let's go back to a bit of basics. So fusion energy has been around for a long time. You probably recognize this one. Um, matter of fact, from the time the sun first existed, it started influencing things on Earth and, of course, gave energy to allow plants and animals and the like. And so that's why they call it fossil fuels, I guess, because it was tens or hundreds of millions of years ago. That was solar energy coming from fusion. But this is not quite suitable as a earthbound fusion reactor. So we have to compare the confinement technique. In the sun, it's gravitational confinement, and that is possible because the mass of the sun is about 300,000 times that of the Earth, and so it is sufficient to contain the energetic particles, at least most of them. If you look at it as a localized energy source, you might not like it, okay? First of all, a lot of radiation, but the power density of the sun is only about 275 watts per cubic meter. And that would mean if you wanted to have a 1,000 megawatt plant, it would have to have a lot of cubic meters. What we're trying to do here on Earth is to get a power density which is something close to 500,000 watts per cubic meter. 
That's what we plan to do on ITER. Also, if you look at, at this source, it is constant. That's good. But that, and that is one of the attributes that we want to put into our fusion devices, too. So our challenge here is to try to bring such an energy source down to Earth in a controllable, compact way <clears throat> that has environmental attributes which are positive. <clears throat> Now this is a slide from Professor Carter's talk at PPPL, and I just wanted to point out that fusion energy shows up in every single column. Would you believe that? Okay, okay, here it is. We talk about coal and natural gas. Okay, here we talk about solar and wind power. That comes from the sun, that's fusion power. Here we got biomass, here we have solar fuels, and guess what, there's fusion power, okay? So, I'm glad to see that fusion energy plays a strong role in the Endlinger Center. Congratulations and thank you, okay? But there are other elements on this chart that I will also try to comment on, and one is economics and policy. And what we're dealing with in development of fusion energy is not just science and technology, it also deals with public policy, deals with economics and finance. So we'll talk about that a bit. Where else does fusion energy show up? Well, believe it or not, it shows up right there. Provide energy from fusion. And these are the grand challenges from the National Academy of Engineering. And so they have recognized that a human-engineered fusion, which has been demonstrated, as I'll show you, even, even close to here in TFDR, okay, has been demonstrated on a scale of 10 megawatts or so, but the challenges in this article would say it's finding ways to scale up the fusion process to commercial proportions in an efficient, economical, and environmentally benign way. And so I see a lot of uh, overlap with the Anlinger Center's motivations here. And I was really inspired by your visionary statement about dedicating your life to research and coupling energy and the environment, because I think fusion plays a role in that. Okay, let's get back to really basics. So this is the fundamental deuterium-tritium fusion reaction in which one type of hydrogen called deuterium, which is about one part in 6,000 of what you find in, in seawater, the hydrogen in seawater, is hit against a tritium nucleus. This tritium has a half-life of about 12 years, so you don't find much surviving from the Big Bang. However, there are ways of producing it, as we'll show. The big problem here is these two repel each other because they're both positively charged, and so we have to find a way of getting these close enough together, about a millionth of a millionth of a centimeter, and I apologize to the nuclear physicist where I'm completely ignoring quantum mechanics, okay? Just ballistics, if, if you have to get them close enough together to stick, and you assume a cross-section like a barn or something like that, which is 10 to the minus 24 centimeters, then 10 to the minus 12 centimeters is where you have to get. And so that means that you have to be a millionth of a millionth of a centimeter, okay? Well, so you have to get those temperatures. So you have energies like 20 kilo electron volts, which is equivalent to like, like 200 million degrees centigrade. And then they form this complex nucleus and when I'm within about a Fermi time or so, it, it falls apart again this time into an alpha particle with about three and a half MeV of energy. And that is confined by the plasma in general because it's charged and contained by the magnetic field. So that is the source of self-heating. So that alpha particle does its self-heating. This neutron is not charged, so it doesn't stay in the plasma. It leaks out. And that's where 80% of your power goes. Now, if you look at this, it says, OK, 20 kilovolts here, 20 kilovolts there. Okay, so that's about 40 kilovolts in, 17.6 million electron volts out. That's a gain of about 440. That's what we're trying to exploit. Now, how do we get this to be hot? Well, the way we do that is we take the alpha particle and we just have it slow down within a thermal distribution of deuterium and tritium. And so that allows you to heat the plasma by the alpha particles. And then how do we produce the tritium? Well, the way we do that is we have that neutron come upon some lithium-6, transmute it, and you get 
tritium, which you then can inject. And so that's how you, so the deuterium comes out, one part in 6,000 of seawater, and this comes from transmuting lithium-6. Now, how do you get the energy out? Well, that energy that went into the alpha particle went into the plasma and comes out and it'll hit the wall one way or another, so that'll go to your turbine, and you can have this hot lithium in one way or another, or some coolant, which then goes out and runs your tur turbo generator. So that's the basic game plan. Now let's compare this to some other things that you're acquainted, acquainted with. So let's take burning hydrogen, okay? So this is a chemical reaction where you start out, and I apologize to all the chemists because I know no chemistry, okay? That's why I write equations with halves of elements and things like that, but it, whatever. So anyway, so we start out with about 18 nucleons, hydrogen and an oxygen, and we burn it, produce water, and release about three electron volts. That means the three electron volts is produced by 18 nucleons, or about a sixth of an EV per nucleon. What happens if you do a nuclear reaction? Well, deuterium and tritium, that's only five nucleons, three plus two, and it produces 17.6 million electron volts. You do the arithmetic on that, and you get three and a half million electron volts per nucleon, okay? And you divide those two, and you come up with two, with 20 million, okay? That's the advantage of a nuclear reaction, and if you look at the curve of binding energy, you'll see that it's really, really steep down there near hydrogen. And so that's how you get so much energy from per nucleon. Now, there are other ways of portraying it, and I won't go through the, the, the graphics of it. One is, if you take a 1,000 megawatt plant and you burn coal, you'll be burning about 9,000 tons of coal per day, and it will be grabbing about twice that in, in mass of oxygen out of the atmosphere, producing about 30,000 tons of CO2. If you were to produce the same amount of power, 1,000 megawatts, and do it from this fusion reaction, it would be three pounds of tritium, two pounds of deuterium, and it would produce four pounds of helium and one pound of neutrons, okay? This is fundamentally different. It's not 30,000 tons, it's five pounds, okay? Fundamentally different. Chris Llewellyn Smith, who, uh, who was a director of CERN and has played many, many roles, has another model where he describes a bathtub full of water provides enough deuterium and the lithium in a laptop battery provides enough lithium that you could provide enough energy for a person for 30 years. Okay, so these are just some of the motivational things. So yes, passionate about fusion energy. There was a uh, simple calculation done by a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, got his Nobel Prize in 1922, and he said to change the hydrogen in a glass of water into helium would release enough energy to drive the Queen Mary across the Atlantic and back at full speed, okay? Okay, well, th this isn't the same as what I did because I'm only talking about the most reactive isotopes. And so there's a factor of 6,000 kicking around in here. What he did is he calculated the mass of the hydrogen and, and the helium and just said, okay, everybody, everybody gets transmuted. So that's almost like the sun where you can turn protons into helium. There are a few other attributes that ought to make us enthusiastic. One is greenhouse gas emission. And there are two types of emission. One is that which is made when building the plant, and one is that is made as an effluent, exhaust. And so the stack emissions are in the dark blue, and you see it's things like natural gas, oil, coal, and the like, and building the plant is the light blue. And so fusion is gonna be comparable to what they call nuclear, and you can see that the greenhouse gas emissions are quite small in the case of nuclear energy. Let's look at land use. If you have to grow things like soy, biomass, cellulose, corn, sugarcane, that sort of thing, you end up with a rel relatively large amount of land use, which is not required for other systems, now, there, there are quibbles here about how many square kilometers per terawatt versus how many square kilometers per terawatt year, you know. There's some things that are per power, like the size of your plant, 
And there's something for energy. If you deplete something, then you keep consuming that. But anyway, just using this representation, you can see that nuclear power is relatively good from the land use point of view. How about from the waste point of view? Well, if you start out with various fission reactors and you look at out to 500 years, you can see that the inhalation toxicity or the ingestion toxicity is up in this region, whereas these fusion reactors, if properly designed with the right materials, could be down there with the level of the radioactivity in coal. Not quite as good from the ingestion point of view. But in any case, there are significant uh, opportunities here. And then if we go back to, back to uh, Professor Glazer and Professor Goldston, they examined proliferation risks and found that it's really hard to hide that somebody is trying to produce bad stuff out of a fusion reactor because it's very hard to hide a fusion reactor. So clandestine, is, he says, not credible. <clears throat> or if somebody is going to try to use the neutrons from a fusion reactor that's operating and subject to safeguards, you will be able to notice it because why else, is, why else would there be any, uh, radioactive, any, any uranium or plutonium there? Now, of course, if you went to hybrid reactors, that's a different story. And then if you decided to have a fusion reactor <clears throat> and then decided to tell everybody, inspectors get out, I'm going to divert this to producing fuel, turns out that would be relatively easy to detect and uh, it would be a while before they would have sufficient material to be, uh, to be a problem. And as is pointed out in the article, the danger of of bad things happening if you bomb this plant is considerably less than a fusion reactor. So let's talk a bit about different approaches to fusion. Okay, so the first is what's called inertial confinement fusion. And this is where you implode a small pellet of deuterium and tritium, get it hot enough that before it can distribute itself, it will have reacted to a significant extent. That is explored mostly with regard to, to what's called stockpile stewardship, where you try to study matter in extreme states. That's where its money comes from, and that's their main focus. <clears throat> then there's magnetic confinement, where one has a much more dilute plasma, but it is held for much longer times. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. <clears throat> but while we're talking about uh, inertial, <clears throat> let's talk about about the way they do it, for instance, at Lawrence Livermore Nas National Laboratory. Okay, so they have laser beams coming in, 192 laser beams, shine onto this so-called whole ROM, which is a box, gets hot enough, emits x-rays, the x-rays then implode the pellet in a more uniform way, and that's the way they attempt to produce this compact pellet. At the University of Rochester, they have a configuration where they put lasers directly on it called direct confinement. And both of these are viable approaches. This one has ways of smoothing out the irregularities due to the lasers. This one is much more efficient because you, you get a direct bombardment of the pellet. But I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about this. <clears throat> so magnetic confinement fusion is an alternative where you try to hold this plasma for very long periods of time, and you let the alpha particles slow down in this plasma and keep it warm. Okay? Now, the first models essentially were, well, let's, let's make a really long magnetic field. And you take advantage of the fact that the transport along the magnetic field is like a million times faster than perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if you can make it long enough, then you'll be contained only by the perpendicular transport, Okay, you might make a reactor. It's going to be very, very long. However, then a few people had an aha eureka moment. And they said, let's take this long thing, which is subject to end losses. How can we eliminate the end losses? You turn it around and you turn it into a donut. And what leaks out of one end goes into the other end. There is no end. You have topologically eliminated end loss. Okay, so that's the idea there. And so there are various approaches. Both of them, all of these that I'm showing here, 
rely on the fact that the magnetic field pretty much tells the plasma where to be. Unfortunately, it's not quite an equilibrium. There are various exotic things that cause particles to drift in different ways and produce electric fields. And the trick that you have to do is to short out an electric field, a vertical electric field, by having the magnetic field line touch the top and the bottom. That's called rotational transform. In the tokamak, it is generated by a plasma current. So the magnetic field fundamentally goes around this way, but the plasma current generates a field the other way, which carries the field line from top to bottom, shorting out that vertical electric field. There was, in fact, an earlier concept called the stellarator, invented where else but here, okay, in Princeton. Okay? And we can thank Lyman Spitzer for that. And he had a variety of ways of getting the magnetic field to go from top to bottom. This shows a rather complex arrangement of coils, which is a modern approach to how to do it. He had other ways, like you take a simple donut and you twist it into a figure eight. That also does it. Okay? So there are a variety of ways of doing this, and different pros and cons. Uh, tokamaks tend to be pulsed because they have this induction through the center. And so it takes some work to keep them going steady state. Stellarators more steady state. Disruptions uh, are, are, are tokamaks are somewhat sensitive to disruptions, and so there's an issue of how do you avoid them or mitigate them. Stellarators uh, may be immune to such disruptions. And so there are things to be examined, pros and cons. And there are a variety of other approaches. Uh, this is a tokamak called JET in its pretty much current configuration of what's called an eater-like wall, where you have beryllium facing the plasma and a tungsten diverter. <clears throat> And you can see how complex the insides of these things are. You've got, this is sort of an exhaust area called a diverter. Magnetic fields go down in there and it pumps. These are things for our antennas for launching waves. You've got a variety of them. You've got some of them are aligned with the magnetic field. A variety of heating sources. So it's a rather complex innard. And uh, some of you were actually, may have actually been over in Germany when uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel pushed the button to create a plasma back on February the 3rd. And I'm very pleased to see a head of state enthusiastic about fusion. It was, it was wonderful to listen to her speech, you know. I was so envious. <laughs> there are other approaches being studied with some private funding. Um, Jeff Bezos of Princeton fame uh, has been supporting general fusion which uses some pistons to try to create some shocks that might heat the plasma. Um, Mr. Theo is supporting Helian Energy. Paul Allen is supporting Trialpha, and Lockheed Martin is doing their scope work. I, you know, people ask, are these going to work and the like? I wish them luck. You know, I just want fusion. I don't care how. Okay, and if these work, fine. I wish them all sorts of luck. But I'm going to talk about the most developed confinement system, which is called the tokamak. And here you can see the two devices that, to date, have been used with deuterium and tritium. At the left is the tokamak fusion test reactor. Dale, you can cheer now. OK, okay cheer, cheer. OK. Um, this, is at, this was at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory and produced 10 megawatts of power in 1994. And that's probably Doug Lozier in there, isn't it? Uh, so you can see the size of the device. This is JET, which is the Joint European Taurus, now known as JET. Okay? And you can see the man. And it produced 16 megawatts somewhat later than TFDR's 10. Not that there's a lot of competition going on here, right? Now, if you look at these traces, you'll see that uh, TFDR in 94 produced for less than a second about 10.6 megawatts. And JET uh, did something on the order of 16. They also produced a lower power pulse for longer periods of time. So there are different things being studied in, in these different devices. But the bottom line is fusion power has been produced in tokamak-like configurations. And now the challenge is to do it longer pulse, higher power, 
and to do it reliably and then next step, make it attractive? Well, back in 2001, there was a meeting of University Fusion Association which attempted to determine whether we are really ready to proceed to burning plasmas. And Jeff Friedberg, who was the chairman of that, is a professor at MIT, gave his final summary as, now is the time. And so that led to a community activity called SNOMAS, where, where about 300 scientists and engineers, starting in 2001, going into the summer of 2002, did a study of what are the benefits of burning plasma, and concluded, yes, there are exciting, there's exciting science there. It's good science. And it also could lead to fusion energy. Assessed what are the different approaches, and are we technologically and scientifically ready? So the conclusion there was, yes, we are scientifically and technologically ready. And the third is various pros and cons of different approaches. That report was given to a Fusion Energy Sciences Advisory Committee, chaired by Stuart Prager. And then that uh, led to the Department of Energy commissioning a National Academy report, which had people like Bert Richter and John Bacall and the like on it. And they wrote this book in which they concluded that burning plasmas are the next large scale step and said that ITER was the preferred approach. And then in January of 2003, President Bush announced that the United States would join the negotiations on ITER. And so we see ITER up here. You see a relatively flat line. It didn't continue up at the Moore's Law rate. And that was for lack of a major facility. <coughs> and so what we're trying to do is to make the next step one that produces reactor scale type powers at reactor scale for periods of 400 seconds or so. And in order to produce that 500 megawatts, we want to use not more than 50 megawatts of heating power to the plasma, producing a gain of at least 10. That's, in the jargon of fusion, that's called Q equal 10. And so that's a key mission element. And you can see here that what we're trying to do now is to produce 500 megawatts, 400 seconds for this fusion gain of 10, which is a major step from the JET TFDR sorts of parameters. So let's, uh, let's look at what we're trying to do here with the uh, recommended approach using ITER. As I said before, there are some major scientific and technological questions. One of them is, what are the dynamics of a self-heated plasma? Today's plasmas are externally heated, and so you can put the power where you want it to some extent. You can spin the plasma different ways. You have more control of an externally controlled plasma. What we want to do here is to figure out how do you control a plasma where it does its own heating, or its heating is dominated by the fusion power from the, from the plasma. And so here, the normal techniques don't always work. And you begin to think of exotic things. And so I had some interesting conversations with people here today talk about talk about different ways of doing, applying control theory and the like. But really, you know, you come up with ideal things like, well, if the thing is going to produce its own power, maybe you control the profiles by controlling transport coefficient profiles and things like that. That's exotic stuff. And that takes real understanding. And you have to figure out what are the actuators that you would use to implement transport barriers at different points. Second would be, what are the effects of these energetic particles? these alpha particles that come out at around 14 million electron volts, which actually are sort of faster than the speed of light in this medium. And so they can excite various waves. And we have to see whether or not we can avoid significant loss due to these energetic particles. How do we control them? How do we mitigate them and the like? And the last thing is, what is the behavior of a plasma at reactor scale? Nowadays, we have to extrapolate to the scale of a reactor. If we had something the scale of a reactor, and then maybe even make the next, maybe real reactor smaller, it would be an interpolation, not an extrapolation. And so that would significantly reduce the risk. 
So in my mind, what we're trying to do is to reduce the risk related to a burning plasma so that people are willing to go on to the next steps of, of, of plasma physics up to the next steps of fusion energy. And at the end of my talk, we'll talk about in what order do you do those things and what do you do in parallel. So as I said, we had these different studies of what to do. But we also, starting in 2003 through 2006, had to figure out who's going to do what, who's going to build what components, and how are we going to structure the eater organization, how are we going to manage it, what's the governance going to be, all that sort of thing. And that took three years. The, the roughest thing was the siting. Okay, where are you going to put it? And there were a lot of proposals. You know, at first, nobody wanted it because they didn't want to be first. And then breaking the deadlock was Canada. Wasn't even a member of the negotiations, okay? Okay, said, so, we'll do it, okay? And then all of a sudden, Japan jumped in and Europe jumped in, you know? So it was an interesting dynamic. But here we have uh, 2006, and this is the signature signature event at the uh, Presidential Palace in Paris. And you see uh, Jacques Chirac, Jose Manuel Barroso as president of the European Union. And here you see Ray Orbach, do you recognize him, Emily? <laughs> there he is. OK, so there's Ray Orbach. Th these were the people who were completely authorized by their governments to commit their governments to execute this project. So Ray Orbach had a. Uh, nice sheepskin, sheepskin sheet of paper signed by Condoleezza Rice that authorized him to sign on behalf of the United States. Okay, so this is not that administration's commitment. This is not Ray Orbach's commitment. This is the US committed to this. Now here is a cartoon of the eater machine. The plasma lives in here. It's a donut. And it faces about 440 so-called blanket modules, which absorb the power on the surface and absorb the neutrons in about a meter thick uh, shield. Behind that, there's a vacuum vessel. Behind that, there are toroidal field coils that generate the big magnetic field around here. There are other magnetic fields, coils, that shape the plasma and drive it. There's this so-called central solenoid through the center for which the US is responsible, which drives magnetic flux through the center, and as it changes, it puts a voltage around the machine to drive the current and to sustain the current. And there are various heating systems and diagnostic systems and the like that, that look in, and it all lives in this uh, vacuum thermos bottle called the cryostat, and it's vacuum insulation in here. Here is the uh, a relatively current picture of the eater site. The tokamak itself will be right there. Okay, so, so that circle is the base on which the cryostat will sit. Then there's around it a thing called the bioshield, which is about a meter and a half thick concrete shield, which will form a big neutron shield around the cryostat. And then, then there's actually a building within a building. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, due to the fact there are earthquakes in this area, the requirement was that the host nation shield eater from earthquakes. Okay? And the way it does that is it built a building on springs. And then so there's an outer building which has 490 seismic isolating pillars underneath it. And then they built a building on top of that. And to some extent, that shields the, uh, the seismic activity. Uh, this is the assembly building where major components are put together and then carried by a big crane and carefully positioned. I used to say you drop the central solenoid in the middle of the machine line. We don't drop anything, OK? That, that, that alarms people. OK, so carefully positioned. This is the uh, colloidal field coil building built by the Europeans because some of these coils, the big ones that are almost the size, it's comparable to the size of the tokamak, cannot be transported over land. And so they have to be built at the site. So they'll be built in here. This is a cryostat building built by India where they bring the parts of the big vacuum cryostat, put them together, and then they're transported over and put on that base. Matt, remind us, how many coils will Well, there are eight. It's 18-fold symmetric, so 18 toroidal field coils. 
and then there are six portal load field coils and central solenoid with six modules. Here's a close-up of that base on which the uh, cryostack is built and the bioshield. You can see lots of construction going on. But most of the construction is not being done at the site. Most of the construction is being done around the world in the so-called domestic agencies, which there are the seven of the seven members. These are some of the deliverables from the United States. We produced five nuclear qualified storage tanks called drain tanks. Uh, these two have 61,000 gallons. And they are used if you want to drain the water from the vacuum vessel or the diverter for maintenance in those, in those systems. And due to various corrosion products in the water, which get activated by the neutrons, there's enough radioactive inventory that they are subject to European pressure directives and the like. And so that made them more expensive than our original estimate. This, is an, this one does not contain radioactive water. That's from the neutral beam. The United States also delivered some of the, this was the first what's called heavy exceptional load which means it had to go on this, on these big fancy transporters with 100 wheels and go on special itineraries. And where's Charlie? Charlie back there is the one who is responsible for specifying and procuring these. So these, are, these go up to 400 kilovolts from the fresh French power grid. They bring the voltage down to a more normal voltage for distribution around the site. Here is part of the Indian contribution. These are the cryostat, cryostat base components being put into that cryostat building. You can see it'll be, be a quite large base, and then they'll build it up. Now, in Europe and Korea, they're making vacuum vessel segments, and this shows one segment being worked on. This is the poloidal field coil building winding facility. You can see the size. Of, of the magnetic coils that will actually be outside in order to control the shape of the plasma. They are built by the Europeans on site in the Europe. One of the major procurements had to do with niobium 310 strand and the production of, of cable and conductor. Uh, the United States and five other parties did that. And so the United States bought 40 tons of niobium-310 filament, about a millimeter in diameter. And that then will, it was wound into rope. You can see sort of a rope structure here. And the reason you do that is, is to avoid eddy currents when the magnetic fields change. You have to have various twists and, and the like. And then for structure's sake, you put this into a stainless steel conduit and then you compress the whole thing down to secure the filaments. Um, at this point, it's not a superconducting material. This is niobium-310, which when, it is super, when it's niobium-310, is very brittle. It's a ceramic. And so you could not bend it into a coil and crack. So what you do is you leave it as thin filaments of a mixture of niobium and tin. And then you form the coil. And then you heat it up to something like 600 degrees C for 100 hours so that the niobium and tin react and you get niobium 310 and now you have a good material. At that point, you don't want to bend it, okay? So you better have it in the right shape. This is what happens when you have wound that material into the right shape and you put it into a furnace. So this is the furnace and this is the Japanese furnace for toroidal field coils. And so they will, so at this point, that material has been heated up and turned in niobium-310. Then it gets put into what are called radial plates, where, you, where it has roughly the same shape, and you put them in, and that provides mechanical support for the coil. And you can see the size of that, because you can see some of the gentlemen and ladies. Here is the US facility for producing the central solenoid, which is this roughly See, each one is, six, is two meters, and there are six of them. So let's, let's call it 12 meter tall uh, magnet. It's about 13 Tesla, 130 kilogauss. And it is at the center of the machine, drives the current, shapes the plasma, and the like. 
And we build the, these coils from material that comes from Japan. And here is a typical spool of superconductor, coil it, uh, cable and conduit conductor, as it arrives from Japan. There's another one back here, which has been mounted on a despooler, which is a rotating table. And the conductor comes along to a winding machine where it's turned into a, a multi, well, turned into a spiral magnet. And then the different layers are put together in the next station, called a joining station. And they work their way around. And where this camera is, is the heat treatment furnace, which is this really big furnace with very hot gas in it that, that heats the material, turns it into nanobeam 310. And then it's taken down to this, to this station, which is one where you put the whole thing up on the top, and then you slowly lower the bottom winding, and you have robotic systems that put tape on it to do insulation. And then this whole thing rotates, and eventually all of those windings are down at the bottom. Okay, all wound. They then go down. They then go down, and are put into a doer where we do vacuum pressure impregnation to provide the structural strength to make it one big monolithic coil. Here's the winding machine. You can see the conductor coming in here. There are three rollers that cause it to bend. And you can see that, that it's a circle. There actually is a flat point in here that allows the radius to increase. And it goes around, around, around about 13 times. And then there are stacks of four or six, a quad or a hex of pancake that get joined together, and then those get joined together to make a module that's about six feet tall, and we're making seven of those. Well, that's where we are on ITER, but what are the challenges that remain? And what is our current status on some of these things? Well, some of these are scientific and technological, and some of these are more political and financial. Let's explore some of those. Well, how do you want to develop these things? Both the plasma physics and the materials and all of that. Well, you could take, could take what was called the Edisonian, whoops, Edisonian quadrant, where you try lots and lots of things and you see what works. Well, it's not the approach we're taking. Or you could just conduct research for its purity but that might not address our application. Uh, we much more favor this thing called Pasteur's Quadrant, where we do the research based on what's needed for our application. Okay. So we're trying to figure out not just the plasma physics, but the materials and the components and everything else related to fusion energy, and trying to acquire the understanding for those things that are needed for producing an attractive fusion reactor. And if we look at those things, they divide somewhat neatly, but not totally neatly, into things that are plasma science and things that are nuclear science. And among, in the plasma science, we have plasma dynamics, like confining the plasma, dealing with transients, dealing with energetic particles. And I have that in green because that's proceeding at a pretty good rate. What's not proceeding at a good rate? Okay? It's this other stuff. Okay? So at the boundary between good and not so good, I would classify as power exhaust, where there is some effort going into power handling and plasma material interactions. And then there are areas that are clearly not getting addressed enough. These are areas such as structural materials, where in order to make the thermal efficiency higher, you want to have high temperatures in your coolant. So you have to have materials that can tolerate high temperatures. But you also have to recognize that the radiation exposure, let's call it the fluence of, of neutrons, in a fusion structural material is quite high. Matter of fact, every atom in that material is typically displaced 100 or more times. Now, how do you avoid that turning into mush? Okay. Well, you have to have some sort of a self-healing process which allows this material to maintain its strength and its size and survive a long time in order to avoid 
frequent replacements. And so there's a lot of work has to be done in order to produce such materials. You also have to uh, breed tritium. You know, if you look at the civilian tritium in the world today, you discover there's not nearly enough for a fusion economy. And so we need to find ways where the fusion reactor produces more tritium than it burns. And that will allow us not only to keep that reactor going, but also start up other reactors. Okay, so that's important. So you have to breed the tritium, you have to extract the tritium, and you have to have, find good ways of injecting it into the plasma. If you were to develop a program for fusion, for development of fusion energy, you would figure out what are the steps in each of these lines and how do they interact, and you draw a nice network of activities, and you estimate what are the durations for each activity, and from that, you can figure out what's the critical path. In my view, plasma physics probably isn't the critical path right now. In my view, it's down in these areas. And what our strategy, in my mind, ought to be is we sustain the research in plasma dynamics, and we increase these other things, lest we have a situation where we get the plasma physics where it needs to be, and then somebody says, oops, I need another 30 or 40 years to develop the material. Okay. So in my mind, we have to change our paradigm, and we'll get to that. So where are we on plasma dynamics? Well, one area is confinement. And you know, the ITER design used some empirical scaling relations. And now we're getting much better at trying to predict transport in a plasma, and there are very many codes that really do stretch the limits of the supercomputers of the day, and are getting much better at attempting to explain from first principles what is the transport in a plasma. That should continue. Then we have a variety of types of transients. Uh, one is called an edge localized mode, which happens several times per second. Due in, in plasmas that are high performance if they have a really steep gradient at the edge. And that turns out one way of making a high performance plasma is to have a steep gradient at the edge by having a confinement barrier at the edge. But that sort of a steep gradient can drive instabilities. And so we have to find various ways of eliminating that. On D3D and elsewhere, there are various approaches where you see these so-called D-alpha spikes, they can be uh, eliminated by introducing 3D perturbations to the magnetic field. And I, I think that the study of 3D configurations is really important. You can take the form of minor 3D perturbations on a tokamak, can take the form of large 3D perturbations in the case of a stellarator, but that's an area that really needs research. And so you can see that by putting this I-coil current on, you can basically cause loss at the edge and eliminate, reduce that gradient so it doesn't go unstable. You can also shoot pellets in. And so that's another attempt that is done to shoot pellets in frequently to sort of burp the plasma. And so it keeps the pressure at the edge low enough that it doesn't drive the instability. Okay? So that's called pellet pacing. So that's these elms, which, if left to their own devices, will sort of scour the inside of the vessel, and you want to avoid that erosion. Then there are larger scale events called disruptions. And these can cause the, the loss of the plasma. Some sort of instability occurs. There's a loss of the thermal energy. The plasma becomes lower temperature and hence more resistive, and the plasma decays on some sort of an L over R time. If you want to avoid the uh, risks associated with that, you want to predict that one is coming. You want to take some action to avoid it happening. So the ideal thing here is to have a model going that says whether or not a disruption is coming, and if so, what you have to do to avoid it. So the highest priority has to go to disruption avoidance. Okay. The next would be, if you can't avoid it, 
you want to determine when it's going to happen so you, you can take action in time so that you can mitigate its loss by causing a controlled shutdown. And there are various approaches to do this avoidance, to do this mitigation. One involves applying first principles understanding of MHD theory to be calculating the stability in real time and determining whether you're getting close to an operational boundary. And if you're getting close to an operational boundary, you modify something and move away from the boundary. That, that's one way to do it. It's, it's been a long time that we've been trying to do that. There are other techniques which are quite novel, which build on what we might call big data techniques or machine learning techniques, where what is done is you take a big database of previous discharges, both disruptive and non-disruptive, and here we have an example of what happened on the jet tokamak where they, used, they created a rather large database of disruptive and non-disruptive discharges and tried to see how far in advance they could predict the disruption just from using, this, using the computer to learn from a variety of signals. And they found that you, know, you really can't predict very well 10 seconds in advance or one second in advance. And, you can get, and using various so-called characteristics, you can get up to the 80, 95% level. But this is only in its infancy. What we have to do is, is try this as well. I'm all for belts and suspenders when it comes to predicting disruptions. Because we have to come up with a reliable way of determining what do we have to do to avoid them. And if one's inevitable, how do we shut down the plasma reliably? So this is a uh, PPL analysis, which is similar. And what do you do if you see it coming and you want to shut it down in a controlled way? Well, this is a so-called uh, shatter pellet injector, where what, where, which we, are, we, have, we have installed this on D3D. And we shoot a pellet in against the steel plate, cause it to shatter, and it become, looks like uh, shotgun pellets, which are frozen hydrogen, uh, shooting into the plasma. It turns out that if you just puff gas at a plasma and try to increase the density that way, the gas doesn't penetrate very well. But in this case, we're shooting in frozen, hydro frozen neon, frozen argon, and the like. And the radiation then causes the plasma to lose its energy in a controlled way. And then you try to guide it to a benign landing. So disruption prediction, disruption avoidance, and disruption mitigation are key areas for research. How about the effects of energetic particles? OK, well, this is something which, which requires energetic particles. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be studied with alpha particles. You can create energetic particles with neutral beams and radio frequency waves and the like so that you can get an understanding. And here we have something, in this case, from D3D. And you can see that they had various modes called, called alpha, alpha and eigen modes. And they come in a variety of flavors. There are uh, things called toroidal alpha and eigen modes and reverse shear alpha and eigen modes and the like. But what you see, this is a picture using what's, what's called electron cyclotron emission imaging, which was invented by Neville Newman at UC Davis. And so this is a theoret this is actually a theoretical picture. And if you just draw a box, you can see that these shapes are not purely radial. They have some sort of a shear to them. This is something that does not appear in ideal MHD. It's not something that appears in perturbated treatments. It's something that requires non-perturbated treatments and big supercomputers and the like to show this sort of shear. And here is the experimental evidence that shows such shearing does indeed exist. And you can see similar shearing in the theoretical predictions re related to reverse shear alpha and eigenmodes. So this is another piece of research which has to be explored and will, be, will reach a culmination when you really do this with alpha particles and eaters. So let's move to the next topic, which is not as uh, much supported. Uh, this is power exhaust. Now you've got your bulk plasma, 
and the power comes out, hits on this device, on this set of surfaces. And this is called a separatrix. It goes from closed surfaces to open surfaces. In this, this case on jet, about 40% of the power was radiated inside the plasma at the X point. About 60% went on to hit the diverter. And that can cause erosion down in the diverter. One thing you could do to improve the situation is have higher density and perhaps some impurities up here so you can radiate all the power there. And then you don't have the big power load coming onto the diverter. Okay? This is called detaching the diverter. You can do a variety of tricks by designing the geometry in clever ways. Um, early days would have the magnetic field lines come against a perpendicular target, in which case you get a very high megawatts per square meter. You can incline the target and get an advantage out of that. Or you can have very many strike points in this so-called snowflake diverter. You can spread the power by flux expansion. You can see this, this gets wider apart. Or you can have a longer path length. Or you can mix them all together in, in some sort of a complex diverter. So these are plasma physics types ways of reducing the surface power density. There are a variety of processes occur. One is the particles impact the surface and they're reflected. Another is they go in but then come back out, call that recycling, or they can go in and get captured. When they hit, they can cause erosion. Sometimes it just shoots right back and redeposits. Sometimes it stays in the plasma and then comes out somewhere else. You have photons hitting the surface and you have neutrons going through and perhaps even causing transmutation of the, uh, of the material. One of the things that, uh, that happens with the 14 MeV neutrons from fusion is much more transmutation than from the roughly 2 MeV neutrons from fission. You can get something like 50 times more transmutation and produ production of hydrogen and helium. Now, this power flux can give rise to various damage. For instance, the thermal cycling can cause cracking of, of tungsten, like seen here from ULIC. Or you can get hydrogen injected. You can even simulate this, Emily. Okay? <laughs> and the hydrogen can migrate to grain boundaries and you form cavities, and then it can cause blisters and all sorts of good things. Okay? Then you can get, hasn't been seen too much on tokamaks, except in various small samples, you can get some funny, fuzzy sort of stuff produced, produced on uh, tungsten. And Brian Wirth at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Oak Ridge National Lab has done computational simulations to try to predict uh, or try to figure out how does that come about. And he's not yet figured out how do you get at high temperature this fuzz or these wires or these corals, coral reefs, and all sorts of things that can form there. So this, this has to do with the plasma material interaction. Now we get into the more structural materials. These are the ones that provide the mechanical strength. And if you look at the environment of a fusion reactor, you'll see that, that we're in extreme material conditions. We have more displacements per atom than in the fission reactor configurations. And we try to operate at higher temperatures in order to get the higher thermal efficiencies. And so we're in a challenging world. <clears throat> You'd like to have something that can handle the high temperature, like silicon carbide, silicon carbide fiber composites, and the like. <clears throat> it's not quite there. Yes? There should be a time associated with that picture. OK. What is that? I'll have to think about that. Okay, the question was, what is there a time associated with that? But this, oh, this would be the, like a 30-year lifetime, or a five-year for components that are replaceable. Okay, so if it's replaceable, it's like five years. If it's permanent, you assume something like 30 years. Okay. And that's how long it takes to build up these DPAs. So if you go down to the world of uh, reduced activation for most steels, 
you find that they have a certain lower limit of temperature below which you get things like, uh, like radiation hardening and you get fractures. And it's because you don't get adequate mobility of various defects. And so you want to raise the temperature. So that's where you'd want to be up there. The oxide dispersion strength in steels have smaller grains and limit the mobility of certain alloy elements and the like. However, it's a very expensive material. And you want to find ways of producing it less expensively. There are a variety of things that can happen at various temperature ranges. And these are five types of radiation damage. And let's just look at some of them. But before looking, let's try to develop a mental model that allows you to put this data in some sort of a structure. So at low temperatures, you have limited mobility of the defects that get caused by the neutron radiation. And so you end up causing the material to get harder. It can fracture, and it doesn't self-heal very much. So you have to go up to some temperature, 30 40% melting temperature, something like that, in order to get the increased mobility. Above that, you have to then suffer the consequences of mobility. And you can have vacancies coalesce, and you can get expansion of the material because the vacancies cause expansion of the material. You can get alloy materials moving around, and the chromium can get away from the iron, and then you get, you're subject to corrosion. So there are probably things happen in the range of 40 to 60 percent of the, of the melting temperature. And above that, uh, you, you actually end up mobilizing helium. And the helium can form a variety of uh, things. It can form bubbles, cavities, and the like. And so if you look at the effects, so if you look at the effects of radiation on stress strain curves, you can see the hardening of the material. If you look at the intermediate temperatures and put these things in situations of stress, you can see that the uh, defects can move in a direction related to various gradients, and you can actually fracture various things. If you take a uh, unirradiated piece of steel and you irradiate it, even up to only something like 10 to 20 displacements per atom, you can get a significant expansion in both length and diameter of these components. And you can't have too much of that in structural materials, and so you want to find a way of limiting that effect. You can find various uh, precipitates appearing and moving around. And here's a case where the helium migrated the grain boundaries and formed cavities and that sort of thing you might expect to fracture. Another area, so anyway, the game there is to try to design materials that are more self-healing and can handle the higher temperatures and maintain their strength and, and shape and volume. Breeding tritium is also a challenge which hasn't been addressed much. Uh, there are a variety of models. There are various test blanket modules being put on ITER. And they, they have a range, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But, but for every tritium that you burn up, you produce a neutron. And if you were able to use that neutron to hit the lithium-6 lithium and produce a tritium, you would then have adequate tritium. However, you're not going to capture every neutron, and things aren't going to work perfectly. So you need to have a neutron multiplier, such as beryllium or lead. And so in this particular concept, you, you have, have beryllium as a neutron multiplier. And then you could have lithium in the form of pebbles, and you might make something that looks like a pebble bed reactor. And that would be limited by, by materials like what, what temperature can you go to for the coolant if you have something like uh, phreatic steels and the like. Mohamed Abdu at UCLA has a model where you have, have lead lithium, liquid lead lithium, as the breeding material and have it carrying away the actual, most of the heat. So this requires relatively rapid motion of this lead lithium. But you use silicon carbide, what he calls flow channel inserts, to isolate the steel from this high temperature lithium. And then you have helium coolant leading to then the steel wall. And so this would get you up perhaps 
to uh, as much as 1,000 degrees C and would give you higher thermal efficiencies, but it's very advanced. And there are all sorts of things in between. You can have liquid lithium and a vanadium structure and the like, but there are issues of material compatibility and corrosion that have to get worked out. Then you have to inject this uh, fuel, and we here have pictures of a pellet injector, okay, and this is one that makes relatively continuous streams of pellets. You have this extruder, which is two, uh, two screws that then cause a, uh, cause a ribbon of ice to come, which gets chopped off and then injected into the plasma. You here see uh, an injection into mass, injection into Aztecs. And here was TFDR with the uh, pellet injected density radiating. So let's now uh, look at where we are. What we've done so far is shown that there is significant progress in plasma science and plasma dynamics. That should continue to better understand a variety of topics. But we really have to look at the rest of fusion energy and give higher emphasis to the power exhaust, structural materials, and the fuel cycle if we're going to have it all come together at roughly the same time. So what really limits our, our rate of progress? I would propose that we ought to consider political and financial challenges that could be limiting our rate. And there are political ones like concerns about nuclear systems. And there I think we have to be much better at communicating the advantages of fusion, like the fact that design basis as, uh, accidents don't cause public evacuations, the fact that there's not a high level, radio, a big quantity of high level radioactive waste, the fact that nuclear proliferation is much lower risk than in a fission system. We have to make sure that we can exploit those, those characteristics. We have to get some public policies that are based on evidence rather than emotions or something else. And that's something where I think we share a concern with all advanced energy systems. And we have to find a way of having a recognition that we really need to have greater commitment to following the facts and pursuing the right opportunities. And then we have to be able to recognize that long times might be involved for these more advanced energy systems. And it can't just be, what can I get in the next quarter? Or what can I get in my administration? Or what can I get you know, in 10 years? So long term is a challenge. And as, as we heard from some recent congressional hearings, investment in international things is also a challenge for some people. And so we have to recognize that that mega scale science projects will largely be international. Maybe the proprietary things will be in, in demo or something like that. But right now we're at a stage where international is the effective way to do the large scale projects. Not that it's simple. We can go a whole nother lecture on the complexity related to international. However, we have to figure out how to do that and not be resistant to it. In the financial area, as I said, we have to increase the federal investment, particularly in advanced energy R&D. And I put it in, in emphasis, and fusion science. We have to increase our investment in the fusion nuclear science in order to have it keep pace and be ready at a time when we have understood the burning plasmas and we're ready to go. Back in 1976, there was a study by the Energy Research and Development Administration of a variety of funding scenarios for the development of fusion energy. So we've adapted from that and turned it into uh, $2012. dollars And you can see what, they, they all agreed on 1976 budget, but then they said, okay, if we just sort of stay at what was the 78 projection, what would happen, and you can see that it wouldn't happen by 2012 or 2020 for sure. Okay, and actually, the level budget 
at that level was characterized in the report as fusion never. Okay? There's a certain minimum that you have to exceed in order for fusion to be ever. Okay? And then there were other more adventurous scenarios, which you can see were quite high and delivered quite a bit earlier. And here you have to really appreciate that in order to minimize the total cost of developing something, you have to do it at an optimum rate. If you drag it out, it's going to cost you more. Okay? But that's going to mean you have more money spent in a given year. So you need to plan it out, come up with an optimum profile. Oh, I didn't put the trace next to actual funding. Anybody want to guess where it is? <laughs> that's where it is. So right now, we are considerably below the fusion never line. Okay. And we have to really think about what are we doing and what it is that we have to do to make it to fusion energy. Here actually is a trace of the fusion budget versus time. And you can see that the gas lines of the 70s had an impact. And then when that got cured, it fell back down again. And we've had a few baubles here and there, but the president's budget request is down about 50 million relative to 16. So we're not on a good trajectory there. <coughs> Now, there was, there was the fellow who led the Tokamak program in the Soviet Union before the US got into the Tokamak program. And he was once asked, when will fusion be ready? And he said, fusion will be ready when society needs it. And I think we have to ask ourselves a question, which is, if you take into account the long lead time associated with many of these systems, when do we have to start? And at what rate do we have to proceed to be ready when fusion is needed? That's a serious planning issue that we really have to confront. And it, it's something that we have to ponder quite, quite hard. So here's my characterization of the present fusion program. <coughs> it appears that, that we're pursuing plasma science, leading up to a burning plasma in the form of ether. But we're not investing in nuclear science at any large rate. And the logic in my mind is that it is portrayed that the risks associated with a burning plasma are prohibitive and that we should wait until we've achieved a burning plasma before making a major investment in the non-plasma aspect. Okay? We can argue whether that's the case, but it's consistent with the evidence. And in that case, what you end up is with a critical path, critical path driven by the achievement of a burning plasma, and then starting up and finishing the development of fusion nuclear science, leading to some sort of a demonstration reactor. Well, that's what I call a risk-averse strategy, because we're saying we don't want to risk developing the nuclear science until we're sure we have a burning plasma in place. But the net effect of that is to put the fusion power quite far off on the right side. If instead you had a parallel approach where relatively soon we were to decide that the risk of the burning plasma is low enough that it is prudent to get involved in the nuclear science earlier, such that both the plasma science and nuclear science come together at the right time, you could actually accelerate it from the previous date to this date by at least 10 years, it may even be 20. Okay? So I think we need to have a really serious program plan that considers the fact that a sequence of achieve a burning plasma and then do the nuclear science is going to delay the achievement of fusion energy unnecessarily. So I'm calling for a refined strategy to accelerate fusion energy recognizing that Project Matterhorn here was started in 1951, and here we are in 2016. Let's see, that's 65 years, okay? That's a long time, and I think that our confidence in burning plasmas is such that we can afford to take the risk of moving on to, uh, to nuclear science. And that unless we do something like that, 
the old joke about fusion energy always being 25, 30, or 50, or whatever years away will actually be true. And in order to avoid that, we have to continue our research in the plasma part, but we have to increase our investment in the fusion nuclear part. We have to move from this risk-averse strategy where we dare not do the nuclear science until we have a burning plasma in hand. We must go to a success-oriented strategy where we have adequate confidence that we don't have to wait until we have a burning plasma to start the nuclear science. We have to develop the nuclear science and its technology earlier and get the two communities of plasma science and nuclear science together to pursue fusion energy for real. So where are we? I think that at this point we can say that, that we should be excited about fusion energy. Not only is it good science, it has an abundant fuel, it's safer, and in fact, we are making good progress in the area of plasma science. And what we need to do is to move on to more research in the area of plasma material interactions, structural materials, and tritium breeding and extraction, and thereby enable all the parts of a fusion reactor to be ready at the time when it's needed. Thank you very much. Questions. Excellent talk. Do you have a plausible scenario that you can solve the Lipsky theorem about basically no raw material can ever be found that will stand on the neutrons? Well, I think the real question is the lifetime of, of the materials that, that are exposed to the neutrons. And you know, if you could never find a material that was more self-healing than what we know now, it would require relatively frequent, you know, five years or something, Ooh, replacement of, of... That's excellent. Things. But what you really want to do is, is find materials which are much more self-healing. And, and, and Steve, Steve Zinkel, who's my coach on such things, uh, tells me that, that he think is, thinks it is achievable to have 99.99% of these defects recombine and self-heal. Okay? And that means that if you had 100 displacements per atom, after the self-healing, only 1% of them would look like they've been displaced. That, that's his the, goal. What are the most promising material now? Well, right now, the, I'd say that the reduced activation ferritic marstamidic steels with where you have to, where you have to get rid of, where, where you get rid of things like the copper and the nickel and the molybdenum and the like, which make it make them more radioactive. You ought to move on toward more, uh, more oxide dispersion steel type things, but that's too expensive. So you have, so S Steve is pushing that what we have to do is mimic the limitations on the mobility due to the small grains in the oxide dispersions strength and steel by various techniques of distributing precipitants and dispersancy calls them in order to provide trapping sites at various places and various thermal process, thermal actions which it, he thinks can make it. So I think that there are ideas and I would invite you to get somebody like uh, Steve Zinkel or Brian Wirth or somebody like that to talk about it because one of the things I learned today is you have an awful lot of materials people here, okay? And I think that there are opportunities for engaging them in a lot of exciting things. And so I think we ought to form some sort of a uh, team between Princeton and Oak Ridge, you know? We have high flux reactor, we have lots of instruments, and you have lots of bright ideas. And so I would encourage such a, such a sharing. Thank you. <clears throat> you quote uh, Absimovich. Yes, <clears throat> your buddy. He's your buddy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
famous astronomic saying was that people ask him when fusion will be. It was in the 60s, yeah. when fusion will be ready. He always said 23 years. Yes. So one day, about 60s, when I start on, on plasma physics, I asked Lev Andreevich, why are you saying 23 years? Oh, because 23 means it is very good meaning. It is not 30, 50, but 23, it's the exact number. That's great. Well, well, I, I, I remember back to the um, Mike McCormick and the Fusion Energy Act of 1980, right? And we were gonna have a fusion reactor by the year 2000 or something like that. But the thing that didn't come true is the budget profile, okay? So that clearly slowed things down. Now, I'm not saying that we would have been able to spend that budget profile prudently back then, but I think we are now in a position where we are much better empowered to make good use of the money and make progress. So what is cost right now on int ITER used to be 5.2 billion. That's a long time ago. A long time ago, I know. So what is right now? <laughs> well, it all depends how you count it. But I mean, if, if you look at what the different countries will say, that they will say that they are that their 10% share, so to speak, is three or four billion. So 30, 40 billion. 30, 40 billion. So the major message you're giving, there's two bars in the middle of triangles yeah. on them, is that materials is nuclear science needs to get a larger fraction of the or addition. A larger effort, a larger effort, and you put the incremental effort into nuclear science, which means materials. Is the materials, is the nuclear science that you're talking about, hmm. material science. Right. So you're worried that we won't have the materials to build this thing. You will discover from ITER and, and the research labs that will, research will happen decades from now that we actually can't make the stuff that we need. Well, that, about that, that's one years. way of looking at it, yeah. That's, that's the, not a, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, it's on. Okay. I'm just, I, want, I just want that after you're done. Oh, <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, so there is some effort to do the materials science, but you would scale it up in a few new facilities that would, would start getting built now that would be running at when eaters pushing along in the mid-20s. Well, late 20s. no, I, I wouldn't wait for what the it development of new facilities. I, I think that right now you could start, you can clearly start a lot of computational simulations. Right now we could use reactors to provide neutrons, we can use spallation source to provide neutrons. It's not the fusion spectrum, so one thing that you could do is that you could develop good computational models of, of the interaction of fission neutrons with materials and spallation neutrons with materials. You can implant hydrogen, helium, things like that into damaged materials. You can study the behavior of that. You can do lots of diagnostics on those materials. And those facilities all exist. Okay. Is that expensive, what you're just asking for? Is that, no, round, I, isn't that a I think we, we have to go beyond that. I, I'm saying we're ready now to use existing facilities to irradiate materials, to implant materials, and to simulate materials. And with the integrated model, I think we can get a large, long way. By doing that, I'd argue we get many of the benefits that are, would otherwise be delayed until, until a fusion materials or radiation facility, which is a long way off. And so we have to have a progression. And I think we need a program that takes advantage of existing facilities and computation to explore today what we know and try to plot a course and then figure out what are the right facilities to address these things. So just to follow up on this line of, of discussion, you know, uh, fusion energy sciences basically shut down a program, mm -hmm. right? right. Uh, that many of us were involved in, associated with plasma material interactions, because mm -hmm. they said they didn't have the money. Right. And so I agree with you, there needs to be more money put in, but there has to be, if, if if such money isn't forthcoming, decisions have to be made in terms yes. of, of prioritization. Right. So yeah, there are many people here who would like to continue that work, but 
mm -hmm. know, the program was shut down. And, right. Um, we were not I think that's quite, a, quite unfortunate. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I guess I would add one more thing, just, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to make a point about vested interest, except that there is, there is, you know, as you, as you say, evidence that there is no money for this right now, mm -hmm. even though it's important. In addition to taking existing materials that, that you know, you can bombard with neutrons or, or implant hydrogen or whatever and see what happens. I mean, I think that there really needs to be, um, I, I have, I'm more skeptical than your friend about, about self-healing of steels, okay? Um, and so I would say that there needs to be some effort put into materials discovery, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and, and so that, requires both an experimental component right. and a computational component. Right. I think, not just I, think I think we're agreeing. I, I, yeah, I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm amplifying more right. to, to say don't just take conventional materials and say what happens to them. Because then you're sort of giving up in the sense of saying, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna use what we know exists. Well, mm -hmm. that's fine. You want to understand those. But if you already know that they have problems, yes. you know, then you want to find ways to, to do materials discovery um, in this area as well, that hopefully will lead to something that is mm -hmm. that is more self-healing. Right. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, you showed a uh, nice overview of the. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, of the research, uh, one thing I was missing was in construction. So when you discussed about how it is constructed, most of the important parts are built on site because they're either too big or too fragile no, no, actually not. to move, unless I misunderstood. No, if you, if you look at the big cost items, it, it's things like the magnets. And the toroidal field coils, which are the biggest weight, so to speak, those are built in Japan and in, and in Europe out of conductor that's built in all parties except India. And the central solenoid is built in the US and shipped. And so I think that the coils are roughly a third of the cost of the machine. And those are not, the only ones that are being built at the site are the full oil field coils, which are not that expensive. They're niobium titanium rather than niobium 310. And so they're not nearly as hard. Uh, so as a matter of fact, another metric is, is 80% of the domestic agency's money is being spent in their country, which says that 80% of the value is, is not at the site, and that 20% is the amount that goes to the site for the, for the construction, at the, for the assembly at the site and commissioning. The only activity which is at the site but paid by a domestic agency is the buildings, which is paid by Europe. Okay, so we're kind of running out of time. I'll ask the last question. So uh, whenever we have this discussion, either people say what you say, like, we need materials research, yeah. and then FAS people, they're scientists, so they say we need more papers, publish great scientific papers. Do you need something in between? Because either people, you barely have enough money to build the you know, big things that you need to build for either, and FAS only has money for the science, so how do you bridge the gap between that? Do you need something else, or you need well, I, I think the fundamental problem is that there's not, not a sufficient investment in advanced energy R&D overall. And, and so it's not just fusion that should get more money. There are a lot of energy technologies. And we ought to treat this as though we were a clever portfolio manager and try to bring up all these different possibilities and develop them to the right point and then turn them over to industry. Great, thank you very much. And if you have more questions, we'll be out there.